I'm Chloe, an architect by profession, and in that moment, I was a bride walking down the aisle. Every detail of my wedding had been meticulously planned, from the flower arrangements to the playlist that would serenade us through the night. I had always envisioned this day as a scene straight out of a romance novel, where love conquers all. Jack, my fiancé, stood at the altar with a nervous smile. An engineer, logical and straightforward, the yin to my creative yang. I believed we complemented each other well, excited to embark on this new chapter of life together. However, as our eyes met, I noticed a distant look in Jack's eyes, almost burdened. Dismissing it as nervousness, I proceeded down the aisle. Yet my unease deepened when my would-be mother-in-law, Linda, leaned over to her neighbor, whispering something with narrowed eyes, sizing me up. When our eyes met, she forced a smile, mouthing, you look beautiful, but the smile didn't reach her eyes. As the ceremony continued, and the pastor asked if Jack took me to be his lawfully wedded wife, there was an agonizing pause before he finally said, I do. However, his eyes lacked the warmth I had always associated with those words. During the rain exchange, Linda stood up, taking a photo, declaring loudly that we must capture the moment, stating that weddings are just the first day of a lifelong commitment, her words more a warning than a blessing. At the reception, Linda approached me with a saccharine tone, commenting on my unconventional dress and hinting at my rebellious nature, trying to keep the atmosphere light. I responded, I believe weddings are a celebration of love, so why stick to convention? Yet Jack's intervention, though momentarily relieving, carried a resignation that shouldn't be present on such a joyous day. As the first dance began, Jack held me at arm's length, our bodies swaying in rhythm but our souls feeling miles apart. The song meant to be an anthem of our love mocked me. And Jack's question, So, Mrs. Clo, ready for forever? A code in the cavernous space between us. Unsure of what forever held, I said yes, hoping the ominous cloud hanging over us would lift. Little did I know, this was just the prelude to a saga that would test not just my marriage, but the very core of who I was. The feeling that something had already come to an end lingered, even as everyone raised their glasses to toast our new beginning. After the wedding, returning to my cozy three-bedroom dwelling, purchased with years of hard work, was supposed to be our sanctuary, but the walls that I thought would protect us turned into a prison, a stage for domestic warfare. Linda's subtle invasion began, marked by frequent unannounced visits and relentless criticism, culminating in the shocking announcement that she would be living with us. As she claimed a corner of what was once my reading nook, my heart sank, and I looked at Jack, pleading for him to intervene. I managed to pull him aside, my voice quivering. This is our home, and we should have discussed this before any decision was made. He looked at me, his eyes void of the love I thought I had seen just a few months ago. Mom's getting older, Chloe. She shouldn't be alone. She should be with family, he said, emphasizing the last word, as if I weren't considered family. So I'm not family. Is that what you're saying? I questioned, feeling the hot sting of tears starting to form. You know that's not what I mean, he retorted, clearly exasperated. But mom has done a lot for me, and I owe her this much. What about what we owe each other? We just got married, Jack. This is supposed to be our time to grow as a couple, not play house with your mom. But my arguments fell on deaf ears. The decision was made just like that. My opinion, my feelings, my home. None of it seemed to matter. And so, Lyndon moved in, turning the love nest I had envisioned into a battlefield of egos, tensions, and outright hostility. Every room in the house felt heavier, suffocated by her presence. I could no longer find a quiet corner to read, a peaceful moment to reflect, or even a loving glance from the man I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with. That's how I realized I wasn't just fighting for my marriage or my home. I was fighting for my identity, my dignity, and my peace of mind. All the while, a single thought echoed through my head. How did it come to this? How did my life, my home, 
My choices become secondary to the whims of someone else. My reading nook was now a shrine to Linda's possessions, my kitchen a stage for her criticisms, and my husband. Well, he was a stranger siding with the enemy. And all of this was just the beginning. If I thought life was hard before, it was nothing compared to the living nightmare that followed. The atmosphere in the house grew denser each day, as if the walls themselves were closing in on me. What made it even worse was the undeniable two blue lines on the pregnancy test I held in my trembling hands. I had always imagined sharing the news of my first pregnancy as a moment of joy, an occasion to be cherished. But as I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror, eyes red from restrained tears, I realized this milestone had turned into a millstone around my neck. When I told Jack about the pregnancy, his response was as lackluster as ever. Well, that's something, he mumbled before quickly changing the topic to discuss a home improvement project his mother had suggested. It was Linda, of course, who took the reins of my pregnancy as though it were her divine mission. She began dictating my diet, my activities, and even the hospital where I would deliver. But her intrusion didn't stop at unsolicited advice. She managed to turn my pregnancy into another venue for her psychological warfare. You're eating again, she would say, her eyes darting towards the modest sandwich I'd made for myself. Shouldn't you be careful about gaining weight during pregnancy? This is doctor recommended, Linda. I'd reply, mustering all the patients I had left. Doctors these days don't know what they're talking about. Back in my time, we knew how to handle pregnancies, she'd counter. And so it continued. As the weeks went by, my energy waned, but Linda's expectations soared. She turned my home into her personal palace, ordering me to clean, cook, and cater to her needs as if I were a servant rather than a daughter-in-law, and a pregnant one at that. Chloe, why haven't you vacuumed the living room yet? She'd yell from her self-assigned throne, my old reading nook where she'd spend hours scrolling through her phone or watching daytime TV. I've been feeling really tired today, Linda. The doctor advised me to take it easy. I said, my voice tinged with desperation. Tiredness during pregnancy isn't an illness, you know. Jack once again remained conspicuously silent, his compliance deafening. The tension reached a breaking point during another heated dinner discussion, where Linda decided to critique my choice of baby names. That's a ridiculous name for a child. You might as well pin a kick me sign on his back for his entire school life. Linda sneered. Enough is enough, Linda. This is my child, and I have a say in how to raise him or her, I snapped, my patience finally depleted. Oh, so now you're talking back to me. Linda's eyes flared, her voice escalating. Jack intervened, but not in the way I had hoped. Chloe, you're being emotional. Mom's just giving her opinion, he said. I looked at him, then at Linda, and then at the house that had turned into a nightmare. I felt trapped, humiliated, and utterly alone. I could barely recognize the woman staring back at me in the reflection of my tarnished wedding ring. A woman who was slowly losing everything she had once valued. Her home, her dignity, and most devastatingly, her will to fight. And that's when it happened the ultimate betrayal. Linda, filled with venomous triumph, looked me dead in the eyes and said, if you can't handle a simple family discussion, maybe you shouldn't be a part of this family. Jack said nothing. His silence spoke volumes, cutting deeper than any words ever could. In that moment, I realized that my nightmare wasn't unfolding. It had already unfolded, and I was living in it. My life had become an unrecognizable maze of shattered hopes and suppressed sobs. I moved like a zombie through the rooms that no longer felt like my home. The baby inside me seemed to be the only living part of my existence, and I clung to that tiny spark of life as my last shred of hope. But even that was threatened. One cold evening marked my breaking point. We were having another one of those god-awful family dinners where tension cut through the air like a knife. I had spent hours on my feet cooking a meal that I knew Linda would find fault with, no matter how perfect it was. Each critique was a jab, each scoff a slap. I knew another one was coming, 
and I braced myself for it. But when it finally came, it was worse than anything she'd said before. You really think you're fit to be a mother if you can't even manage a household? What are you going to do with a baby? Linda sneered. My heart sank into my stomach, each word a stab at my already fragile self-esteem. I felt my hands tremble, my eyes blur. But before I could say anything, Jack joined in, sealing my emotional fate. Mom has a point, Chloe. You need to step it up. We're going to be parents soon. That was it, the final straw. A bolt of anger mixed with a lifetime's worth of resentment and humiliation surged through me. Step it up, step it up. I shouted, surprising even myself with the intensity of my voice. I am carrying our child for months, managing our house, and putting up with relentless emotional abuse from your mother, and you tell me to step it up. Both Jack and Linda looked stunned, but I was on a roll. A volcano finally erupting after years of suppression. I'm done. I can't do this anymore, I said, my voice cracking. I won't raise my child in an environment where their mother is treated like dirt. If you two are what family means, then I don't want any part of it. With that, I left the table, leaving them both in speechless disbelief. I packed a small bag and headed for the door, my trembling hands struggling to turn the doorknob. That's when Linda decided to deliver her ultimate blow. Where do you think you're going? This is Jack's house, not yours. I turned around, my eyes locking onto hers. Actually, Linda, this is my house. I bought it, and I have every right to say who stays and who leaves. Chloe, don't do this. Let's talk about it, Jack pleaded, finally realizing the gravity of what was happening. There's nothing left to talk about, I said, tears streaming down my face. With that, I stepped out into the frigid night air, no coat, no plan, just an overwhelming urge to escape. As the door shut behind me, it felt like the closing chapter, the final act of a tragedy that had stretched on for too long. I began to walk, each step a painful reminder of the life I was leaving behind. I had no idea where I was going, but it didn't matter. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I was taking control of my destiny. But the cost of my newfound freedom was high, agonizingly high. The icy wind pierced through my thin clothes as I trudged along the deserted streets. I had walked for what felt like miles, lost in a haze of emotional and physical exhaustion. I was almost there, almost at my parents' house. A sanctuary from the hell my life had become when my foot caught on an uneven slab of pavement. I stumbled, twisting my ankle painfully as I fell to the ground. The pain was sharp, but it couldn't match the ache in my heart. Limping and teary-eyed, I finally made it to my parents' doorstep. The look of horror on their faces as they opened the door told me everything I needed to know. My breaking point had come, a long overdue fracture in a life burdened with far too many cracks. As they rushed me to the hospital, I knew something had to change. I couldn't go back, not to the house, not to Jack, and certainly not to the woman I had become. My breaking point wasn't just an end, it was also a beginning, a painful but necessary step toward reclaiming the life that had been taken from me. Hospital rooms have a peculiar way of forcing reality upon you. As I lay there, my sprained ankle elevated, and my body checked for any complications due to my fall. I felt a mix of relief and apprehension. My parents were there, their faces etched with concern and quiet fury over what had transpired. They'd always suspected that my marriage was far from ideal, but the depths of its dysfunction had finally been laid bare. Close sweetheart, what are you going to do now? My mom finally broke the silence, her voice heavy with worry. I don't know, mom. But what I do know is that I can't go back to that life. Not now, not ever. I replied, my own voice firmer than I expected. My dad, who had been pacing the room, finally spoke. Your mother and I will support whatever decision you make. But you need to think about your future and the future of your child, he said. I nodded, having been doing nothing but thinking. My mind a labyrinth of potential scenarios each one fraught with uncertainty but also tinged with the promise of freedom. It was then that my phone buzzed. It was a text from Jack. 
Chloe, where are you? We need to talk. Ignoring the text, I switched off my phone. Whatever he had to say, it was too little, too late. I was done talking. My actions would speak louder than his words ever could. My first move was a call to a family lawyer, a decisive step in putting an end to my disastrous marriage. With my parents by my side, we discussed of divorce proceedings, child custody, and alimony. There was something chillingly clinical about dissecting a failed relationship in legal terms, but it also instilled in me a sense of empowerment. For the first time, I was taking control of my life, making choices that prioritized my well-being and that of my unborn child. A week later, Jack and Linda were served divorce papers and a notice of eviction from the house, my house. The lawyer also included a clause for a hefty child support payment and financial compensation for the emotional distress I had endured. It felt drastic but necessary, a harsh severing of the bonds that had chained me for so long. When I finally turned my phone back on, I was bombarded by a flurry of messages and missed calls from Jack. Chloe, please, can we talk about this? I didn't realize how bad things had gotten followed by another message, I'm sorry, Chloe. I never wanted any of this to happen. Let's find a way to make it right. For a fleeting moment, I was tempted to call him back, to hear him out. But then I remembered the long nights of humiliation, the years of emotional neglect, and Linda's insidious cruelty that he had silently endorsed. Any affection I had for him was now buried under the ruins of our broken marriage. I deleted the messages, erased his number, and blocked him on all social media platforms. As far as I was concerned, Jack was now part of my past, a painful chapter in a book I was ready to close. I knew the journey ahead would be filled with its own set of challenges. Divorce proceedings are never simple, especially when a child is involved. But for the first time in years, I felt like I was steering the course of my own life, a painful journey, but one that led away from the darkness that had consumed me and towards a future that, while uncertain, held the promise of something better. The courtroom had that sterile, cold air that seems exclusive to places where lives can change in an instant. My lawyer sat next to me, a stack of papers in front of her, radiating confidence. My parents were behind me, their moral support palpable across the room. Jack sat with a look of defeated bewilderment, his mother Linda beside him, her face a mask of indignant disbelief. All rise, the bailiff announced, and Judge Morrison entered the room. The divorce proceeding was a whirlwind of legalese, a barrage of facts and accusations laid bare for the court to dissect. As the evidence of Linda's abusive behavior and Jack's neglect was presented, I watched their faces contort, perhaps truly seeing themselves for the first time through the eyes of the law and through my eyes. The judge turned to Linda. Mrs. Davis, you stand accused of emotional abuse and harassment. The evidence is overwhelming. How do you plead? Your Honor, this is all taken out of context. I was only looking out for my son's well-being, Linda stammered, her voice lacking its usual arrogance. It appears your definition of well-being is quite twisted. Judge Morrison retorted, clearly unimpressed. Finally, the judge rendered her verdict. The court hereby grants Chloe Davis a full divorce from Jack Davis. Custody of the unborn child will be given to Chloe. Jack Davis, you are required to pay child support as determined by the state. And Mrs. Linda Davis, considering the extensive evidence of your emotional abuse and harassment, I'm fining you $100,000 for your actions. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders as the gavel came down, but it was a bittersweet relief. My marriage had ended, not with a bang, but with a quiet wrestling of legal papers. I was free, but at a cost I never could have imagined when I said, I do. As we left the courtroom, Jack approached me, a lost look in his eyes. Chloe, I'm so sorry. I never thought we'd end up here. I stared at him, seeing the man I had once thought I would spend my life with and all I felt was a void where love used to be. I didn't think so either, Jack, but here we are. It's too late for sorry now, I said, 
turning my back on him and walking away. Linda tried to make eye contact as I passed her, perhaps seeking some form of acknowledgement or forgiveness, but I gave her none. She had taken so much from me. I wouldn't give her the satisfaction of knowing she still mattered. When I stepped out of the courthouse, the sun seemed a little brighter, the world a bit more colorful. It was as if I was seeing everything through new eyes, eyes not clouded by constant anxiety and emotional distress. It was the beginning of a new chapter for me, one written on my own terms. My mother hugged me tightly, tears in her eyes. You did it, Chloe. You're free, and it's all thanks to you and Dad. I couldn't have gone through this without your support, I replied, grateful beyond words. We'll always be here for you, Dad said, joining in the group hug, and for your new beginning. That night, I sat alone in my house, the house that was now truly mine, and felt a sense of peace settle over me. I was alone, but I wasn't lonely. For the first time in years, the only expectations I had to live up to were my own. I was still apprehensive about the challenges that lay ahead. After all, I was going to be a single mother with all the responsibilities that entailed. But as I touched my belly, feeling the gentle stirrings of my unborn child, I knew it would be okay. My painful journey had led me to this reckoning, and while scars remained, they were now a part of a story of survival, not defeat. I was ready for whatever came next, not because I had to be, but because I chose to be, and that made all the difference.